Let us just go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we ask you. God, we ask you to meet here with us. Lord, we want to see you. Father, we want to experience you. Lord, we want to feel you today. God, we want to hear your voice. God, we want to see you lifted up. God, we want to see you draw people unto yourself. God, I ask you this morning, Lord, I know there are hurting hearts and there are heavy hearts. And I understand this, Lord. And you know, God, and I ask you to comfort hearts. I pray today, Lord, that you will affirm to people today, God, who you are. Affirm to people today, Lord, that they don't need to doubt, God, whether you're with them or not. Affirm to people today, Lord, that you will see them through whatever storm they face. God, I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to continue looking at life-changing questions from the Bible. And I can just tell you, I, I struggled with this sermon all week. And uh, I felt like, boy, I need to change this sermon. And I, I, we printed the bulletins with the outline on the back, and, and I thought, man, I, I want to change this sermon. That's what I want to do. I, I don't like this sermon <laughs> and, and uh, just don't feel good about it. And, and the Lord just clearly spoke to my heart. You know what? It's not about what you want to preach. It's about what I want you to speak to my people. And, and I just had to say, Lord, I'm just a messenger. And that is exactly what I'll do. And so I felt led early in the week, felt led by the Lord, but fought that in my flesh. And I, I want to just share with you today uh, what the Lord has put in my heart very clearly. And it is certainly a life-changing question. And I want to tell you, if you will, if you will examine this question with, a, with an honest and open heart and and my prayer for you today is that you find the answer to this question. I'm going to seek to give you the answer to this question. It's very clearly in our text. Um, Mark chapter 4, the disciples find themselves caught in a storm. How many of you found yourself caught in storms? Well, that's what the sermon's about today. You find you're going to face storms. The, the disciples were in the middle of a storm. They had a promise from God. You and I have many promises from God. The disciples had a promise from God. And in the middle of the storm, they lost focus of the promise of God. They forgot all about the promise that God made to them. And I understand that this is very early in their journey with the Lord. You understand that? I mean, we're here in Mark chapter 4. They haven't been walking with the Lord very long. And so they find themselves in the storm and they experience a whole lot of what you and I experience. I think you're going to find that to be true. You know, we sang this morning a couple of songs and I could just see the Lord's hand in even the music this morning. We sang the song, My Grace is Enough. I like that song, don't you? But I like it because... Well, I'll be honest, I like the beat of that song. That's a, it has a great beat. It's very catchy. But you know what? I love the message, your grace is enough. I believe that message. I believe those words. Do you? I do believe that whatever I face, His grace is enough. And we sang this song as well, the song Healer. And it says, you hold my every moment. Think about that. Do you believe that? You sang it. Do you believe it? And then it says, you calm my raging seas. Mmm. How appropriate for what we're going to talk about. You know, in October of 1991, there was a storm. It was the storm of all storms. I read about it extensively some this week, and I'm not going to give you all the details. But in a nutshell, what happened was three storms came together, and it was a monstrous Storm. You've probably, some of you maybe have watched the movie, some of you've read the book. It was written, it was put together on this storm. I mean, this storm had that kind of impact that a movie would be written, you know, would, would be put together. It's called The Perfect Storm. Have you heard it? You've seen it? I watched, went back and watched some video footage of 
the perfect storm. And, you know, the perfect storm, there were some boats out in the, out in the Atlantic and they faced 100 foot waves. That's 10 stories. Imagine that. 100 feet. Winds blasted over the ocean at 100 miles per hour. Waves that were 30 and 40 feet battered the New England coast, destroying over 200 homes, property damage, more than $500 million. It was devastating. Many people lost their lives. You know, we've had some pretty interesting storms around here recently, haven't we? We've seen some devastation. I know my, my, my niece uh, lives in West Virginia. Her home was, uh, the, the foundation was washed out. Part of the foundation, four feet, I'm told, four feet of mud in her basement. I mean, just just from the flood, and, and I've heard people say in West Virginia, you know, you and I are thinking, when you see the water coming up, I mean, why don't you just leave? Why, why don't you get out of the way? I mean, you know it's coming. Their response was, it came so fast. You know, you know, when something happens that's never happened before, you know, people say, hey, this river floods, you know, then you know that there's potential for flooding. But when areas flood that don't generally flood, I mean, they've never flooded before. You don't expect it. You're not anticipating it. It comes in the middle of the day when you're away at work or you're, you know, you're inside cooking. You just don't, you know what, a lot, 23 people lost their lives. 23 families affected. More than 1,200 homes destroyed. Over 200 businesses closed down from that flooding. You know, Friday there was a pretty significant storm that came through Vinton, huh? So I'm told I wasn't here for it. I came home on Saturday and saw some of the after effects. A lot of downed trees and and, uh, you know, many people without power throughout our, our area, throughout the region. And uh, thankful that many of them have their power restored today. You know, as we continue looking at the, these questions in the Bible, I want you to see this question. The disciples asked this question, Mark chapter 4 and verse 38. Look at it with me, if you will. Here's the question, teacher. I told you they're early in their journey with the Lord. They call him teacher. Right? They're not calling him master. They're not calling him Lord. He's not the son of God yet in their hearts, in their eyes. They know he's different. They know he's significant. They are, they're beginning to understand that no one's like Jesus. But they can't fully wrap their minds around yet who he truly is. And so they call him teacher. And they ask a question. You see how young they are in their walk with the Lord from this question. Because they don't have the answer to this question. Not in the middle of the storm. In the middle of the storm, when they feel like they're going to lose their lives, when they're full of anxiety, when they're full of panic, when they're full of fear, they ask this question. And I want you to understand, this question is, is more of a yell. This question is a cry. You know, I need you. And, and here it is. Do you not care, Jesus, that we are perishing? You notice the word perishing? They are thinking in their minds, we're going to die. You know, let's look at this question. We're going to glean some truths from this question, this story that we find. And if you've got your outline, please go through this with me. I want you to notice, number one here, the coming of the storm. You know, we read in verse 37, and a great wind storm arose. A great windstorm arose. You know, chapter 4 begins with Jesus teaching by the seaside. The crowd was so large. Thousands of people were, were along this hillside. And Jesus is teaching and Jesus is talking to them. And the, the crowd becomes so large. The people are, are etching in so close. He steps into a boat. And he's standing in a boat and he teaches for most of the day. Think about that. 
And the people don't move. The people don't leave. They, they want to hear what he has to say. Mark 4 and verse 1 and 2. And then it says, toward the evening, Jesus said to his disciples. Now I want you to, I want you to catch this. Verse 35. Don't miss this. That here is a promise of Jesus to these disciples. Here's what he says. Let us cross over to the other side. That's a significant promise. They didn't understand at that point how much they would need that promise. We're going to cross over to the other side. And so what they did, they lifted the anchor and they began to sail a trip that generally would take an hour to an hour and a half. You know, no big deal. Well, it became a big deal. While out in the middle of the sea, they found themselves in the storm of all storms. They found themselves in what they would have described as the perfect storm. And the coming of the storm, it reminds us of storms that we face in life. You know, when we, when we look at this storm that arose, we are reminded of a couple of things. I want you to get this down about storms. Letter A here, storms are not predictable. Amen, right? They're not predictable. You know, in our day and time of, of, of modern science and meteor, meteorology, uh, you know, somewhat they can predict the weather with fair accuracy. You know, you understand that, hey, there's an 80% chance of rain today. You think it's probably going to rain, right? I mean, you know, there, you kind of have a heads up as to what's coming. You know, forecasters can somewhat be accurate in telling us what the weather's going to do. And yet, I want to tell you, that's not true. Even today, this is not true with the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee that the disciples are on in their boat is like no other place that I'm aware of in the world. You see, I've got, I, 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 I got on a sailboat with a tour guide, and I, I, I went out into the Sea of Galilee several years ago. And I remember getting out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and I thought, this is beautiful. I couldn't believe my eyes. And I, I walked through this Mark chapter 4 passage in my mind and I thought, I am sailing the same journey that the disciples went from here to the other side. I could see it. And my guide kind of slowed us up in the middle of the sea and he said, I want you to understand something about the Sea of Galilee. He said, the Sea of Galilee is unlike any place in the world. He said that there are, here we are, and he pointed them out, we are surrounded by furrows and ravines on the mountains there, and the wind can begin to rush down through those furrows, and then the heat, the heat from the sea rising up will meet the cool air of the mountains. It can be a beautiful sunny day just like this, and in a moment of time, this sea can become a monster. He said you literally can get in a sailboat and think, oh, you know what, it's a beautiful day to sail. Let's just go and sail the Sea of Galilee. And you get out in the sea and in a moment, the weather can change and, and you will get caught in a horrible storm. Well, you know, that's often the case in the storms that we face in our lives, isn't it? You know, we could be sailing along with sunny and clear blue skies. Oh man, aren't we blessed? Aren't things going well? Hey, isn't God good? And we say all these things and we, woo, man, life is just going so good and everything is just, oh, fine and... Yeah, you know, it's just fine and dandy. I mean, life's just going well. And then all of a sudden, you can be engulfed by a storm. You know, you get a phone call and it changes everything. You know what I'm talking about? There could be a knock at your door or a visit to the doctor. Suddenly you find yourself in a horrible storm. Let me just tell you this, storms are not predictable. You know, I, I know many times we criticize the weather people, don't we? They said that it was, we're going to get six inches of snow. We didn't get nothing. I mean, six inches and nothing. 
You know, that comes from the mind and the mouth of a little child. You know, and sometimes, well, we might get a, a little skiff, you know, of snow, and then we, we get 12 inches. I mean, I know that's happened here before. You know, you and I, we are not the meteorologists, and we live, you and I, we live in a mountain area. The weather's tough to predict, right? You know, God is the one that controls the weather. He is the one that controls it all. You're going to see that. I want you to just think about this for a moment, though. Storms are not predictable. But let me tell you, and I know you're not necessarily going to like this, but it's true. Storms are not partial. Storms are not partial. Yeah, I want to remind you that, it, listen, it was the disciples who found themselves in this storm. And you know what? Jesus was on the boat with them. <laughs> Jesus was there with them, and this storm came. You know, he, he was with them in this boat, and, and yet this storm showed no favoritism, no partiality. And it reminds me, regardless of what people say, Christians are not immune from storms. You know, we paint the picture to people sometimes that, hey, if you come to Jesus, you're, man, things are going to be so great. Life is going to be so swell. No, it's full of swells, large ones sometimes, right? Oh, it's going to be so good. They're lying to you. Listen, we live in a fallen, broken world. Amen? And by the way, do you not remember the words of Jesus? Jesus said that all who follow me will suffer persecution. You know, sometimes we have the idea that if we get close to the Lord, we're going to be protected. We're going to be sheltered from the storms. And we think, you know what, if I go to church every Sunday, if I pay my tithe, if I read my Bible, I pray, bad things are not going to happen to me. I have to tell you, that is not true. You're going to be attacked. You're going to go through storms. I don't know about you, but the closer I get to the Lord and the more that I seek to do for the Lord, the greater the attacks come. Hello, are you with me? Am I the only one? Listen, if you seek to do something for the Lord... It is by far worth it. I never fear the storm, but I know storms will come. But I also know that there's one that's with me. You know, I wish I could tell you that, 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 it was, that, that was not the case. I wish I could tell you, give your life to Jesus and the storms will, will be over. That's simply not true. Not on this earth. One day the storms will be over. Amen? One day there will be no more storms. Look, you know, I read this story of about a man in Ohio. Let's lighten it up just a little bit. And this guy in Ohio was an old man. And one of his refineries caught on fire. And, and, it, and it was just burning. I mean, dollar signs just going up in the air. All of this oil was on fire. And he called all of the, the fire houses and fire stations. And here's what he said. He said, anyone that can put this out, I'll pay them $30,000 on the spot. Well, pfft. You know, all of these fire trucks come rolling in and all of them stopped about 200 feet from the fire. They couldn't get close to it. Well, here come one volunteer uh, fire department from Calcutta Township. Uh, they came and they appeared on the scene and they come up, they came onto the scene with their rickety little fire truck uh, equipped with one single ladder of a few buckets of sand and water and several blankets and here they come onto the scene and when we reached the point, when they reached the point where everybody else had stopped, they just blasted on right beyond them and ended up right in the middle of the fire. And they take their buckets of water and they're throwing them out. They're taking their buckets of sand and they're throwing them out everywhere. And they're, they're, they jump off the fire truck and they're taking their blankets and they're smothering the fire. And they finally get the fire out. And the old man goes up to them and says, Boys, I can't believe how courageous you are. Here's a check for $30,000. And he looked at the guy that was kind of in charge and he said, what are y'all going to do with $30,000? He was still nervous. He was still shaking. He said, the first thing we're going to do is get the brakes fixed on our truck. <laughs> What's the point of that? I don't know. <laughs> no, I do know. Let me tell you the point of it. The point of it is this, is that sometimes, listen, we're thrown into the fire. And it seems like there's no reason. It seems like we did nothing to be in the fire. You ever been there? But I'm living for the Lord. I'm doing what I think the Lord wants me to do. Why this? 
Does that make sense? And you're thrown into the fire. And just because one is a Christian, it doesn't mean that they're not going to find themselves in storms. Storms can come to the good as well as to the bad. I don't know about you. Sometimes it seems that the bad are the ones that are achieving greater things in life sometimes than the good. Have you ever thought that? You ever felt that way? Storms can come to the good as well as the bad. Storms can come to the saved as well as the lost. Let me just tell you this. There are no partiality in storms. Are you listening to me? I want you to sit up, boys. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Let me give you number two. The conditions of the storm. The conditions of the storms. You know what? This wasn't just any storm. The disciples found themselves, look at verse 37, it was a great windstorm. It was a storm that challenged their talent. It was a storm that challenged their trust. Are you with me? You know, once again, the conditions of the storm that they faced, it reminds me of what our storms can be like. Let's talk about our storms for a moment. Letter A here, the severity we face in the storm. Again, the Bible describes it as a great windstorm. According to one Greek scholar, he took this word storm and here's what he said about it. He said it is never a single gust of wind. It's, it's not a steady blowing of the wind. He said this is a violent storm. This word storm in the Greek, it means breaking forth from black thunderous clouds in a furious gust. With rain and wind, throwing everything, this Greek scholar said topsy-turvy. You know, this was a ferocious storm. This is a, a, a violent storm. Verse 37, look at it with me, if you will. It says, the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. It's filling up with water. The waves are so large that, that they're hitting the boat and they're coming up into the boat. I just want to tell you this. That is a miserable feeling. I've been there. I got on a boat one time and my wife bought me this fishing uh, trip. One time and I saved it to fishing season and I get on Captain Stacy's boat down at Atlantic Beach in Moorhead City, North Carolina. We lived down kind of close to there. and My wife and I went out and we got on this boat. It looked like a storm was coming. I thought, oh man, I was excited. Let's go fishing, you know. Let's get in this boat. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. We got up at 3.30 to be here, so we're going. And we can all get on the boat. There's about 50 of us, and we were going out. All of a sudden, you know, and finally the, the land disappears. You don't see land anymore. That's kind of a weird feeling. I've never experienced that before. You don't see land anymore. It's just all blue. And then the rain started falling. The waves became great. And I'm not kidding you. I sat there and all of a sudden, all of the excitement about fishing went away. Now let me tell you why, because it was like this. It was like every time I went like this, it was like another five gallon of bucket of water was dumped on my head. And I would go like this, and then another five gallon of bucket of water right on top of my head. I couldn't see anything. It's no fun when you can't see, and it's just like this the whole time, and you, you know, you, you don't know what's going on. And I'm just sitting there now praying. I pray this captain turns the boat out. Let's go back. I don't care for a refund. You can keep my money. I just want to go back home. I don't care that I got up early. And finally, he announced over the intercom, we are turning the boat around. I think he should have done that about, I don't know, 20 minutes ago would have been good. You know, I'm thinking 20 minutes ago, but I was thankful. I wasn't complaining. He turned the boat around. And let me just tell you, that's what's going on in this storm. The waves are coming up over this boat, and it's hitting them in their face. They can't hardly see what's going on. You know what? That would cause a lot of panic, wouldn't it? When you don't have a captain. When you are the captain. You know, it's your boat. You know, and, and you've got Jesus on it. I mean, come on. Right? And, I, you know, I'm just reminded by this passage that storms can be severe. 
Our storms may not come suddenly, but they can be severe. Sometimes they do come suddenly. But I want to tell you, storms can be severe. The storms of life can have a devastating impact. They can come with hurricane force winds, and our storms can be like a perfect storm. There can be a combination of events that happen all at once, thrusting us into this storm. I know um, just last night I, I was, Roxanne showed me a comment that someone made on Facebook and they had said this. They said, man, it seems like everything is happening all at once. You know what that means, don't you? They went on to describe it. They said, two of our vehicles are broken down. We have no electricity. And they went on to describe several other things. I called them on the phone this morning. I said, are you okay? Is there, do you need anything? They said, no, you know what? The power's back on. Both vehicles are fixed. Everything just came together. But you know what? They went on to say this. They said, but you know what? In the midst of all this, I'm praising God. In the midst of all this, I love my Lord. And I'm so thankful. Here's what they said. That I have a great husband that's by my side. I thought, what a blessing. You know, to, to describe your tragedy, to describe your storm, and then to say, but in the midst of it, I praise the Lord. He is good. He is faithful. Amen? You know what? The storms we face can be like that. How many times have you heard someone say, my goodness, it seems like when it rains, it... <laughs> what does that mean? You know, I don't just have a flat tire, you know? I mean, I, it, 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 yeah, I have a flat tire, but, you know, the, the roof is leaking, and, and, and you know what? The power's out, and, and I can't do my hair, and, you, you know, it's just... This is horrible. This is a mess. Lord Jesus, come quickly. <laughs> you know? And we do. When we, many times, we, storms come in that way. When it rains, it pours. And let her be here. What happens sometimes in the storm? The anxiety that we feel in the storm. Let her be. Write that down. The anxiety. You ever feel anxious? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to fix that? How are we going to, oh my goodness, this is going on, this is going on. You know, when you think of the disciples, you think of men that were trained. I mean, this is what some of them did for a living. They, 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 they got on the Sea of Galilee. They were very familiar with it. They were fishermen. And they were skilled sailors. They were fishermen by trade, no doubt. They had seen storms on the Sea of Galilee before. But this is a storm like any storm they've ever experienced. J.B. Jones, in a sermon entitled The Storm, wrote these words. He said, you may be sure that the disciples did their best to keep their little boat afloat, for they were expert sailors. Don't miss this. But in spite of all of their efforts, the storm was getting the best of them. The boat was now filling with water. The furious waves dashed into their little boat and a watery grave seemed to stare them in the face. Wow. You know, Mark's description certainly conveys a panic in their hearts. You know what? They're fearing that they're about to perish. Now, I'm going to throw this out there, but you think about it for a moment. Many times we're just like the disciples here. We're trying to take a pail, a pail and we're trying to get the water out, and we're trying to keep the boat afloat, and, and we're doing everything that we can. And then when we come to our, the end of ourselves, we walk into the stern where Jesus is at. When we've exhausted our resources. You know, I don't have this in my notes, but I, I have to wonder sometimes. I believe storms are for our benefit. I believe they're always for our benefit. God wants to do something in your life. He wants to show himself great in your life. But let me just say this. I believe sometimes storms come to get our attention. I believe sometimes storms come to, so God will get our heart. You know, some of you, you won't turn to the Lord on your own. Some of you, listen, some of you, you'll turn to everything else. You'll be busy doing everything else, but you won't come to Jesus. You won't talk to Jesus. You won't spend time with Jesus. Oh, but if a storm comes, then the Lord will get what He wants. Time with you. The prayers of His people. 
some intimacy, some alone time. Find me. You'll cry out to him. He is not a God who wants you living your life doing it yourself. He is a God that wants intimacy with you. I believe sometimes storms come because we don't give the Lord that. We don't give Him our attention. We don't give Him our focus. We don't give Him our time. We're too busy doing what? Are you with me? What are we busy doing? Many times it's unfruitful stuff. Many times it's stuff that doesn't have any kind of eternal impact at all. Right? Our hearts are scattered in multiple places. We have very little heart for the Lord. I believe this is pandemic in the church. And, and you know what? The severity of storms often produces anxiety. You know, my mind immediately just went back to 9-11. You remember that day? Remember 9-11? September the 11th? When the World Trade Center, two of, two of the towers were hit by airplanes. And all of a sudden, what does America want to do? All of a sudden, America wants to pray to the forgotten God. That didn't last very long, did it? Let's turn to the God that we say we don't even believe in anymore. But it didn't last. You see, that should have been a wake-up call for America. It was for about two weeks. But it didn't last. See, storms certainly get our attention, don't they? Storms get our attention. I know when I was out on that boat, I really wasn't even looking at the sky. I was looking at the ocean. I wasn't looking at the boat. I was looking at the ocean. I already looked at the boat. I already seen the sky. It, it, it looked fine. And, and you know what? And, 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 and I'd already seen the boat. I'd driven by the boat many times. I didn't care to look at the boat. I want to see the ocean. And I'm looking overboard. I'm seeing all the ocean. I'm looking all, wow, this is amazing. But then when the storm comes, you begin to look up, don't you? Oh, man, it's starting to rain. Oh, my goodness. The wind's starting to blow. Water's splashing me in the face. You know, storms we face can fill our hearts with fear and a feeling of futileness. We're not in control anymore. We've lost control. We are out of control. The magnitude of the storm can be beyond our resources to fight. Are you with me? It can, be, it can be, be beyond our resources to do anything. We, we, it's out of control. We can't do anything. And we try to cope with the storm. But we, many times we begin to fear at the moment of being swept off the dock or the ship being capsized. Some people have that fear in their marriages. What's it going to take? Is, is my spouse going to leave me? Our marriage is such a mess. You know, things will begin to happen and we no longer have control. But I want you to notice this. One of the interesting things about Mark chapter 4 is that all the while the disciples are fighting the storm, the Lord Jesus is asleep. It's interesting, isn't it? I've often wondered, was he laying there just kind of faking it, you know, like with one eye open, seeing what the disciples would do? The Bible says he was asleep, so I have to believe he was asleep. But, but I've wondered, you know, I mean, how do you sleep in a storm like that? But he was asleep in this storm. And, and the disciples in verse 38, look at this. It says, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. It was this action of the Lord that gave way to this question that the, the, the disciples asked. The disciples awakened him and asked him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They were asking Jesus, how can you sleep in a time like this? We're about to die. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you some questions that I believe was going through their minds. I believe it was in their minds and it was in their hearts as they're up there and they're fighting for, them live, for their lives. But I believe some of these questions are some of the questions that we ask as well. Lord, do you not care? In a moment of fear and panic, the disciples questioned the care of the Lord. Have we not all been guilty? Of the same thing. Lord, do you really care about me? And during the times when we found ourselves in a storm, if we we're all honest, we would admit it that we've questioned whether or not the Lord even sees what is going on. Well, Lord, where are you? God, why? You ever ask those questions? 
You ever said, I just don't feel the Lord at work in my life right now? The Lord feels a million miles away. Lord, where are you? We reason within ourselves, and if the Lord cared, you know, we say, if the Lord cared, he would, he would not have allowed us to go through this storm in the first place. If the Lord cared, this storm wouldn't be happening in my life. If the Lord cared, he would stop this storm. If the Lord cared, he would deliver me. I want to tell you, storms sometimes can be challenging to our faith. But I want to tell you this morning, you've got to nail down in your life that the Lord cares. You've got to nail down. He's on the boat with you. If you're His child, He's with you. Listen, storms are going to come. You know that. But you've got to nail down in your life this morning. The Lord is faithful. And whatever happens in your life, listen, it's for our good. It's a good time to say amen. Yes. Amen. Let me give you number three here. The calming of the storm. Thank God He is the one that can calm the storms. We read in verse 39. Look at verse 39 and notice three words. When he arose. You see that? When he arose. You see, whenever the Lord arises, be sure that something great is about to take place. That's why the psalmist prayed. If you take a note, Psalm 44 and verse 26, the psalmist said this. He said, arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. You see, what do we see when the Lord arises? Very quickly, let me give you some things. The Lord's power over the storm is what we see when the Lord arises. The Bible says in verse 39, look at it with me, that when He arose, He rebuked the wind and <coughs> said unto the sea, Peace be still. Those three words, peace be still. They literally mean be muzzled. Did, did, did you hear that? It, it, th th those three words in their original text means to put a muzzle on it. In other words, sit down, shut up, you're, you're not even going to speak anymore. Storm, you are done. That's what those words, peace be still, means. Jesus told the winds and Jesus told the waves to sit down. Immediately, that's what happened. Can you imagine what this did for the faith of the disciples? They said, he's even got power over the storms. He spoke. I mean, we did everything we could do. I mean, we were frantic. He just stood up and spoke. He just said, peace, be still. Peter, why didn't you say that? John, what were you thinking? I mean, you gave me the water pail to bail water. You were throwing stuff overboard, you know? I mean, why didn't somebody just say, peace, be still? I mean, it all went away. You're right. It's called the Carbonaro effect. For those of you that didn't know, I'm just kidding. It's called the Jesus power, right? It's called Jesus stepping up, having power over the wind and the waves and the one that created it all through his words. He said, peace, be still. You see, when you create it, you can tell it what to do, Right? And Jesus stepped up and he said, no more. Can you imagine these waves all of a sudden just collapsing? It's totally silent. Except for the pounding hearts in the chests of the disciples. You see, when Jesus speaks a word, things happen. Jesus spoke three words. Peace be still. And the storms went away. You know, many people, they need a word spoken from God into their lives. The word of God spoken into your life can change everything. I love a song by the Newsboys. It's called One Word. Here's what the chorus goes like. It says, I hear your voice. It whispers my name. And all at once, you quiet my pain. If your voice lit the sun and night was overcome... You can speak and light up my world with just one word. That's powerful, isn't it? That is what Jesus can do. Many times our prayer should be, Lord, just speak a word to this storm. Lord, you just speak and everything will change. Amen? But furthermore, I see this, the, the Lord's presence in the storm. Look at verse 36. It says, Now when they had left the multitude... 
They took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. Did you notice that? They're not alone on the Sea of Galilee. There are other little boats. Other little boats that said, hey, we're going with you. Jesus is on board. We're going to follow you. Follow you. I believe this. Whoever had their own personal boat, after hearing Jesus speak, they wanted more. These were people that were hungry for more of Jesus. And they had the means of getting on a boat and following him to the other side. And so that's what they wanted to do. They're hungry for Jesus. Listen to me. They were hungry. When you are hungry and you want more of Jesus, more of Jesus is what you will get. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says, When you seek me and search for me with all of your heart, I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Those other people in those little boats got into those little boats seeking more of Jesus, and more of Jesus is what they got. They watched him walk out, and I don't know if they could hear him. Maybe they could see his lips move. And when he spoke... The storm went away. How many of, of you, you've been sleeping? Maybe in your life you're going through a storm and it feels like Jesus is asleep. The Lord, however, you go through a storm, the Lord is present. So let, me just, let me just tell you this. Thank God He is with us. When we go through a storm, that He is there. You see, there was a difference in the little boat that the, the disciples were on. Because Jesus was on that boat with them. Now, you know what? I, if Jesus even seems to be asleep, but yet he's on the boat with me, there is great comfort in the storm. Amen? Think about that. He's with me. He's with me. You know, I want you to look at letter C here, the Lord's promise to the storm. I've got to move along here. Look at verse 35. Pay attention to what Jesus said. He said, On the same day when the evening had come, He said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Did you notice that? Now, if you flip over to chapter 5, Mark 5 and verse 1, They came to the other side of the sea. You see that? You see, Jesus had made them a promise. And in chapter 5, in verse 1, we see that promise being fulfilled. You see, the Lord has promised us, listen, you're going to go to the other side. You know, it matters not how dark the skies may get, how strong the winds may blow, or how high the waves may become. We are going to the other side. The Lord is going to get you through. Listen, that's His promise to you. I was thinking about this this morning. I believe you're familiar with the text. If he feeds the sparrow, how much more is he going to take care of you? Listen, listen. how precious of our Lord. Amen. He, he's mindful of the birds. If he's mindful of the birds and he takes care of the birds, how much more is he going to take care of you? You know, in light of His power and in light of his, his presence and in light of His promise, it's no wonder that Jesus rebuked the disciples for their lack of faith. We read in verse 40, the Lord Jesus said this, but He said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? You see, I believe the Lord may ask us the same question. You see, we have great stories, Bible truths like this in front of us. Some of us, we've been journeying with the Lord a long time, and we've seen the Lord get us through storm after storm. And, you know, we've seen the storm, we've faced the storm, we've been in the storm, and He's carried us through the storm. He's gotten us to the other side of the storm. And yet for some of us, we still become anxious. For some of us, we still doubt. For some of us, we're still asking, where are you, God? Listen, hear the words of Jesus. Why are you?
are you so fearful? Some of you are asking, you know, what's going on in our world today? Look at everything that's going on. What's the world coming to? Oh, my God. And there's fear. Is the world going to end? You know, or what's going to happen next? Why are you so fearful? You see, you and I are the ones that shouldn't be fear, full of fear. You are the ones that, we are the ones that should be full of trust. Amen? And he asked this question, how is it that you have no faith? How is it that you have no faith? Let me just in closing say this. I don't know what the days ahead of you hold. I don't know what the weeks and the months and the years hold for you. I can say this. I pray it will be times of blessings. I pray it will be full of joy. And yet, let me tell you, it, it is possible, however, that you're going to face storms. I would say you are going to face storms. But I also want to remind you I want to remind you to hold to the hand that holds your eternity in His hands. Let me give you three things very quickly. I don't have them in your notes. But three, a three-pronged anchor from which you can hold on to in the storms of life. You see, one prong is the truth that Jesus is there to guard you through the storms. He's there with you. He's going to guard you. He's going to protect you. Second truth is is the joy that he, listen, even in the midst of the storms, he can gladden your heart through the courses of the storm. Whatever the storm brings, there is joy because of, of the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10 says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The third prong is the wisdom and the power of Almighty God to guide you every step of the way through the storm. Now, lastly, write down two passages of Scripture. I want to give you this. I want you to read them later. This is your homework. Psalm 31, verse 23 to 24. Read that. And lastly, Psalm 46. It's filled with comforting truth when we face the storms. It begins by saying this, God is our refuge and strength of very present help in time of trouble. <clears throat> My dear friend, I want to close by asking you, how many of you, maybe you're in a storm right now. You're facing difficult things right now. Some of you, you're not. Some of you, this week, you may face a storm. What are you going to do? Who are you going to turn to? You turn to the Lord, right? You know what? You can be filled with anxiety if, you, if that's what you choose. I think many times our response is to pick up the phone and call and tell somebody. Man, I'm going through a lot of stuff. You won't believe what happened. I know last night somebody took a picture of a tree that fell on their house and sent it to us. You know, I believe that's our immediate response is, is to, to, to reach out to somebody, to turn to things, you know, to, to, to call the homeowner's insurance, you know, to, to, to in the middle of the storm, to, to do whatever we can do to protect ourselves. We know a bad storm's coming. We get out the candles. You know, we go to Home Depot and, and we buy a generator. You know, I mean, when we know a, a storm's coming, I mean, we'll do everything that we humanly can do, speaking, humanly speaking, to stay comfortable. Even in the middle of a storm, right? We want to be comfortable. It seems that we live in a world and a society that teaches us to do everything that we can in our own strength. Listen to me. It should be our first response to get on our knees and pray. To turn to the Lord. He should be the one that we run to first. He, listen, He should see a heart, the heart of a servant who says, Lord, I'm in a storm. Or Lord, I see a storm coming. And Father, what, you know, whatever the storm is, that we get on our knees and say, Lord, things are raging in my life, but I know you're the one that's in charge. God, if you take care of that little sparrow, I trust you're going to take care of me. 
whatever the storm holds, whatever the outcome is, I, I trust you. I love you. I worship you. I live for you. Whatever the outcome is, I'm yours. And I pray that every Sunday morning even, devil tempts me. Well, what if the service is real low? What if people don't show up? What if the church doesn't continue to grow? And there's all this, all these gifts and all these what ifs and what if, you know, and all this stuff. And then many times it's just the enemy. And I just look back at the Lord. I, I just look to the Lord and said, Lord, these are your people. God, they have a choice to make as to whether they'll be here to worship you or not. Father, this is your church. Lord, you lead your church. Father, the results of this service, they're yours. But Father, I ask you to move. Lord, I beckon your help. Father, I cry out to you. Lord, we want to experience you. Father, just this morning, stand in the back. I said, Lord, you make yourself famous today. Lord, you help people today to nail down in their lives what they're going to do when a storm comes. I pray that you leave here today with that nailed down. Let us go to the master of the sea right now in prayer. I know I'm out of time, but would you go to him? Here's our altar call right now. Would you go to him in prayer? And would you say something like this, Lord Jesus, regardless of the storm, you have my heart. Regardless of the storm, you have my life. Regardless of what I will face, Lord, I, now listen to, listen to this before you pray. Lord, I commit to you. You will be the first one I run to. You will be the one that I trust. You will be the one that I worship. You will be the one that I praise. Regardless of the storms. In the good times and the bad times. Win or lose, I will praise you. I love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. He is good, isn't he? He is good. I pray you have a blessed day today. If you're not in a Sunday school class, you should go visit one. We have a Sunday school brochure over on the Welcome Center. It talks about all the Sunday school class. And I'm telling you, Sunday school is a blessing. You get to know people. You get connected. You learn a little deeper in the Word of God. Amen. Sometimes a whole lot deeper. And uh, so pray through that. I'm headed to the marriage Sunday school class right now. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, boy, I pray you have a blessed day, a blessed week. Let's make money.